Hello, and welcome to the Williamsburg Botanical Gardens 2021 Virtual Butterfly Festival. My name is Judith Alberts, and I serve on the Gardens Board of Directors. So housekeeping for today, we were going to try and live stream this, but we just had some difficulties, but the recording is our backup. Uh, so sorry about the YouTube live chat, it's not happening. Um, and please give us because we are volunteers. All right, so a little bit about the garden. For anyone who watches this recording and you don't live in Williamsburg, Virginia, you probably don't know a whole lot about us. But the garden is located inside Freedom Park, is free to visit, free to all visitors, including canines who wish to bring well-behaved humans on a leash. And we are open every day of the year from 7 a.m. until dusk. The garden is actually quite small. It's two acres inside a roundabout on the way to the parking lot. But we pack a lot into those two acres with 18 different types of habitat, including a wildflower meadow, woodlands, and wetlands, to name just a few. Our garden is purposely more natural than what you might expect when you hear the words botanical garden. It is most certainly not a manicured display of high maintenance plantings. Think of it more like a wild child with strong emphasis on native plants. And yes, we leave our stems and stalks standing in the winter time to support pollinators and other wildlife. It is the site of uh, Monarch Butterfly Way Station number 3394. The garden's mission is to demonstrate environmentally responsible and sustainable gardening and to offer education on those topics. Everything in the garden is tended by dedicated volunteers and we do it on a slim budget. So I would like you to consider supporting the garden. We are a 501c3 nonprofit. We receive no funding from any level of government. We depend on memberships and donations and we have a link to our virtual donations jar in the description of this video. And if, you're, if you live close by, we invite you to join the garden. The season to order your spring blooming bulbs and Brent and Becky's Bulbs in Gloucester donates a very generous 25% of your order if you start at bloomandbucks.com and select the nonprofit of your choice. And we hope it's going to be us. If you shop on Amazon, please start at smile.amazon and select, again, a nonprofit of your choice. And we hope it's us. It's a small per percentage of your purchase that comes to us. And uh, every, every, penny every penny counts. You'll find the garden on Facebook, Instagram, and of course, YouTube. And if you raise monarchs and live reasonably close to Williamsburg, we have a Facebook group that is intended so that its members can share milkweed when we get to the point in the season where we're all running out of milkweed for our hungry caterpillars. If you would like e-news from the garden, here is a short link to lead slash WBG news, or there is a sign up link on our website. Today's speaker is Adrian Frank, who is a member of the Historic Rivers chapter of the Virginia Master Naturalists. She has studied butterflies for over 10 years by participating in butterfly counts and collecting data on local species, including their host plants, behavior, and sightings. She coordinates the annual Williamsburg Area Butterfly Count in association with the North American Butterfly Association. She has been a past speaker for the Gardens Learn and Grow series, as well as past butterfly festivals. Adrian, thank you so much for spending your afternoon with us and welcome back. I'm gonna stop my share and hand it over to you. Thank you, Judith. All right, let's see if I can, is it, are you sharing my screen now? Can you see my screen? I see your screen. All right. Um, I just wanted to tell you a little bit about um, 
about uh, where I'm coming from with this. Um, the Master Naturalists and also the Coastal Virginia Wildlife Observatory uh, help to sponsor some of the activities that we do. Uh, we had a small group, we have a small group of butterfly enthusiasts who've been working on what we call an annotated um, bibliography of the butterflies in our area. And we have identified uh, 93 species. We've observed 93 species of butterflies in the Williamsburg area, which is really just incredible. Um, and we've done a little bit of uh, citizen science research in, in addition to that. So I just wanted to, to thank our sponsors and uh, wish us luck in continuing to um, identify and learn more about the butterflies in our area. Uh, I recently looked up where butterflies got it, their name, and um, it's just as the picture here shows, butterflies got their name from a Dutch scientist who, believe it or not, saw the um, poop of the butterfly and thought it looked like butter and called them butterflies, which incredible, just incredible. Um, in this PowerPoint, um, just about every single picture is taken from the butterflies in our area. I have a lot of photographs and I'm gonna go through them very quickly. So Lepidoptera is the order of um, butterflies and moths and Lepidoptera means scale or winged scale. And so here's a picture of a wing and then here is on the right is a picture of the scales. What's the difference between a butterfly and a moth? A moth flies primarily at night and makes a cocoon and butterflies fly mostly in the daytime, and they make a chrysalis, which is hard and smooth. Uh, moths have tent-shaped wings, and often it hides their abdomen, but for this little rosy maple moth in the bottom corner, you can see the abdomen just a little bit sticking out between those wings. Butterflies tend to hold their wings vertically. Um, up on their backs. So here's a variety of different butterflies who are all sitting with their wings up and closed. Moths have feathery antenna or saw-edged antenna. So here's this huge tulip tree silk moth and its antenna looks just like a feather. But this other smaller moth has like a sawed edge on its very thin um, antenna. Butterflies have club-shaped antenna, either a bulb or a hook. Most of the larger butterflies have the bulb and the skippers have hooked antennas. So what are these? Well, these are actually hummingbird clear wing moths. Their, mo their wings are shaped like a tent that goes back and down. Um, and they uh, fly during the daytime and they're beautiful. And some people have thought that they might be hummingbirds and that's kind of how they got their name. Parts uh, of the butterfly, they have the clubbed antenna of this black swallowtail. They have six leg legs, four wings, and a proboscis that wicks up the nutrients. So they stick that into the flower and they actually uh, kind of like laying their tongue down They and using a straw, it wicks up the, the uh, nutrients, the nectar. Here is a picture of a closed wing. And if you're doing butterfly identification, it's helpful to know what the names of the parts are. I think the most important one here um, is the, the um, the forewing and the hindwing, because there's very different patterns for many of the butterflies, uh, depending upon which set of wings. So in this picture, you can also see the 
forewing, the leading edge of the forewing, and the hind wing. And you can see it has fringe. Some butterflies have more fringe than others. Um, and where the cell is, whether it's close to the body or not, uh, also helps with identification of some of the trickier butterflies. This is a painted lady. And you can see with the painted lady, it has four dots or five dots that run down the hind wing. Um, this is an American lady. And, and this year we have a lot of American ladies and not very many painted ladies. But this American lady has two big brown eyes and one spot of jewelry. Uh, the jewelry you can see is on the open wings. Uh, my husband likes to use one president and two houses of Congress, uh, but you know it's an American lady because of uh, the patterns. What's the butter, uh, butterfly life cycle? So every butterfly has a different life cycle. The American lady uh, usually the eggs will uh, last for three to five days before they hatch. The larva, uh, the caterpillars will uh, eat and grow for about 10 days. Then it forms a chrysalis or a pupa. And then that stays uh, until the butterfly is ready to uh, come out of the chrysalis. And then the adult lives for about two weeks. So how long do most butterflies live? Well, some butterflies and moths only live just a couple of days. So small blue butterflies, they don't live very long. But some of these other butterflies at the bottom, like the, the monarch that overwinters in Texas, California, or Mexico, or the mo morning cloak that um, can overwinter as an adult in bark or in leaf litter, or the painted lady. The painted lady actually is a big migrator in Europe, and it migrates from northern Europe all the way into Africa each year. So those butterflies can live for a year or more. What's the difference between species, the male and the female? Well, some, you can't see any difference at all. Some have a very subtle difference, like this male monarch with the two scent glands on the hind wing versus the female that has no scent glands, no dots on its hind wing. Some look very different while others look almost exactly the same as their counterpart. Here are uh, two fiery skippers and they are actually engaged. Um, Mating and, um, and laying eggs is the primary purpose of adult butterflies. And so you, you can see a lot of this mating uh, going on with different species. Here is a variegated fritillary that's laying an egg on its host plant, which is the passion vine. And you can even see a small egg on the leaf below. So laying eggs, they can lay hundreds of eggs, and uh, we hope that some of them survive each year. They do like to test out the leaves and make sure that they're tender. So some butterflies will actually bounce up and down on the leaf to make sure it's something that they want uh, to lay their eggs on. They can kind of smell it or detect its odor. Uh, to find out whether it has the right chemicals in it. Um, and, uh, and then they will go ahead and, and lay their eggs. Their caterpillars grow from a very tiny little thing that comes out of that tiny little egg. And they go through um, stages when they kind of molt. Uh, and they might grow uh, four or five times, and they call them instars. They look a little bit different. Uh, for some uh, caterpillars, uh, they might look really similar, um, but others uh, kind of almost transform from each instar to the next. Um, the, we have some butterflies, uh, caterpillars in our yard right now. 
Um, the Brazilian skipper likes the canna plant. That's its host plant. And it goes an inside of the leaf. It, it cuts itself. It eats some of it, but it also then pulls part of the leaf over on top of itself. And here on this side, the long tail skipper, uh, it is really tiny. I don't know if you can see it on uh, this side up here on this left side of the leaf, but it's really tiny. And then it makes this almost this pocket, almost like this tent uh, of, a, of a shape of the leaf in order to protect it from predators. Uh, caterpillars then um, will uh, spin themselves and into a... Um, into a chrysalis. And this is a variegated fritillary chrysalis, and it looks different over time. The, the younger it is when it's first um, been uh, transformed, it's very light in color, and then it gets darker. And as it's ready to split open and the adult come out, uh, it can be, it can look very much almost like the caterpillar underneath. It comes pretty dark uh, in its coloring if it's a dark butterfly. Adults will push out from uh, that case and they will struggle to come out and it takes a little while for them to inflate their wings. Uh, they have to pump this myconium fluid up into the wings, and then they have to let their wings dry uh, before they can take flight. Um, we were in a field with a whole bunch of milkweed, and the monarchs were on it, uh, and there was one that was all wrinkly looking, and this uh, man picks it up and he says, what's wrong with this butterfly? And I had to say to him, you know, don't don't pick it up, um, you know, put it back where it was. It just needs time to finish uh, inflating its, its wings and letting them dry so that it can uh, fly away. Um, butterflies um, will, some will fly in the spring, some will fly in the fall, uh, some fly in the summer months, and they have different ranges. Uh, so they can be common or uncommon, depending upon where uh, it is in the range. Some butterflies only fly in the spring. So this orange falcate, which kind of looks like a cabbage white, if you look really quickly at it, flying by. A dusky wing, juvenile's dusky wing, and a Henry's elfin. They all only fly here uh, in the springtime. There's butterflies that fly through for fall migration. So you can see sometimes uh, hundreds of monarchs uh, sitting on top of goldenrod or in trees as they take a rest um, and roost um, before they continue on in their travels. The buckeyes also might migrate up and down the river. So one day, uh, my husband and I were walking along the York River at Croker Landing, and there were a hundred buckeyes on uh, this bone set. The cloudless sulfur is really kind of an interesting uh, butterfly. We see more of them in the end of the summer than we do in the middle of the summer. And they have a tendency to fly north. So if you sit on the beach at, uh, at Nags Head uh, during um, this time of year, you can see the butterflies flying north along the beaches or along the, the houses. Um, and you can see here that the cloudless sulfur, male and female, look very different. Uh, the male is on top here and the female is on the bottom. And here is the uh, caterpillar, the large caterpillar uh, of the cloudless sulfur on Senna, its host plant. Flight patterns. Some butterflies, the larger ones in particular, float and they flap and they can create a whirlpool and they can lift up as they go, and they can duck, and they can weave, and they can make a 90 degree turn. And why do you think their flight is so bumpy and turbulent? You can guess that they're trying to get away from predators. 
But monarchs and some other butterflies, they have a very slow um, and easygoing uh, flight. And it's because of their coloring and they're showing that they aren't very palatable. They don't taste very good. Some smaller butterflies like skippers will flit but they can also dart really fast and they can go up to 37 miles an hour. I was so surprised to hear this. Um, in my backyard, the little Zabulon skippers, they, uh, they like to chase each other and they will chase each other over the house and back and forth from a, from a, a plant that they really like. Um, but the males can be very territorial and they can, uh, and they can get into fights uh, with the other Zabulon males. Butterflies will bask and to get warm. So you sometimes will see them on rocks or on stones. And um, butterflies like to fly between 60 and 108 degrees. Um, but if you're out on a cold day or even in the morning and it's 65 degrees, we don't see very many butterflies flying. But when it gets to be the middle of July and it's 90 degrees out, that's when you see all the butterflies. Here is the little Zabulon skipper I was telling you about in our backyard. He likes to perch and roam and patrol and uh, defend his territory. Here is a tiny little common uh, skipper, common checkered skipper, and you can see his proboscis in this tiny little aster flower. He's nectaring. These red spotted purples like uh, tree sap. In fact, sometimes you, find, you come upon a tree that is running with sap and will be just covered with different kinds of butterflies. Uh, they love to get nutrients from the tree sap. Sometimes butterflies, especially male butterflies, will puddle. And here, it, this is along uh, the Dragon Run um, uh, in, the, in the swamp, and you have uh, zebra butterflies and uh, Eastern tiger swallowtails, and they are all puddling on the mud. Butterflies can overwinter um, at different stages, and some of the larger butterflies are the ones that can uh, overwinter in tree bark or in logs or in the, in the uh, leaf litter, while other butterflies will overwinter as eggs or as larvae. In our area, we have 13 types of butterflies. The red ones here are not uh, found in Virginia, but we have swallowtails, whites and sulfurs. We have harvesters in, Williamsburg, in the Williamsburg area. We have several different hair streaks, blues like azures and eastern tail blues, uh, variegated fritillaries, uh, crescents, pearl crescents, brushfoots, there's a lot of them. Uh, satyrs, there's several of them, lots of skippers, and um, metal marks, and some of these are found more in the mountains than they are in the Williamsburg area. So swallowtails, the largest um, uh, group of butterflies that we have, they all have tails, and many of them, uh, especially the males, are either uh, black and white or yellow, uh, yellow and black. The eastern tiger swallowtail, which is our state butterfly, can look very different depending upon if its wings are open or closed or whether it's a male or female. And the, the um, eastern tiger swallowtail female is often called a morph because it just looks so different. It's dark. Um, so in our uh, research that we do, we have found uh, over time that butterflies, the eastern tiger swallowtail, flies from March until November in our area. And it may have three or more broods of, um, of eggs and, and adult butterflies. Uh, we know that um, it 
flies all over the place uh, in our area, in gardens, in woods. We've seen it in all sorts of different places. Its hosts are tulip trees, cherries, sweet bay, bay magnolia. Um, but I've seen evidence of the butterflies, um, the uh, caterpillars eating the tops of the tulip trees, the tulip poplars. Um, and we actually thought something was wrong with the trees because all of the leaves on the top of the tree were eaten away. And that year was the year that we had lots and lots of um, Eastern tiger swallowtails. The pipe vine uh, swallowtail is not seen very often in our area. Um, but we saw one uh, at York River State Park last Monday, um, and we were tickled to see it because it is such a beautiful, large uh, butterfly. But it eats pipe vines, and the pipe vines contain uh, toxic acids. And so, again, its colors uh, tend to ward off predators. Spice bush looks really similar um, to, uh, to the pipe vine, um, but its caterpillars eat something that's not toxic. And so uh, when this butterfly mimics the pipe vine, it's telling their predators, you know, stay away because I may not uh, taste good either. I might be toxic, so don't eat me. There are a couple of other butterflies that have the same kind of coloring as pipe vines. The eastern tiger swallowtail morph, female, probably uh, looks like the pipe vine um, as, as a way to protect itself. And the red spotted purple, which is not a, a swallowtail, but it's a brush foot, it also has similar coloring to ward off uh, predators. Whites and sulfurs are another family of butterflies, and they are medium to, uh, to large, small to large in size. They, they have a fast flight. We were chasing a sulfur uh, just yesterday, trying to get a good identification of it. Here's a good way of kind of looking at the different sizes. So the cloudless sulfur is the biggest and can be up to about two inches. And um, the cloud, uh, the orange sulfur or the clouded sulfur is about medium size. And the little yellow, we don't see very many of those. They're only a half inch uh, in size. Gossamer wings are, are very delicate winged butterflies. They're very fast and erratic. Um, they usually sit with their wings up and folded back and they're the largest group in the world. Um, we have quite a few different um, hair streaks in our area. Here's the harvester. The harvester is really interesting because it's the only caterpillar that eats woolly aphids on alders and beech trees. And we don't see these very often, but we have seen one fairly close to our house, which is up in the Toano area. Here are some of the hair streaks that we have. The red banded hair streak, the juniper hair streak, the banded hair streak, and they all have these little tiny tails and the tails go back and forth like this and they have all have kind of little eyes at the uh, base of their hind wing. And they think that they move their tails uh, and the little eye to distract the predators uh, away from their real head. So I've seen little hair streaks that have a big chunk of uh, wing taken away by a predator, uh, but they're still flying around. So it's a, it's a good protection to have those little extra eyes. Had to put this in, great purple hair streak is about the prettiest butterfly. Its host plant is, um, uh, mistletoe. And so you see it often in swamps, and there's a lot of them in the Great Dismal Swamp. That's where we've seen most of them. But this one was actually in Yorktown. Blues are small to very small 
uh, fluttering, um, erratic flying uh, butterflies. The eastern tail blue has little tails and little eyes and often flies near the ground. And the azure is uh, more likely to fly higher in the trees and often looks much brighter in its color. Oops. Now I've done it. Um, crescents and fritillaries. These are pearl crescents and they can look really different uh, depending upon um, just their age or uh, wear and tear um, or just the way that they look. Their host plant is asters uh, and they're a fairly common butterfly in our area. Great spangled fritillary, most of these we see on the other side of Richmond, but we have seen a few close by. Variegated fritillary, that often comes to our yard, has a really pretty um, red caterpillar. Brushfoots, this family has a lot of different um, butterflies in it, and they're called a brushfoot because they have a reduced non-functional four leg uh, folded by their breast. They can be different sizes. They can have different uh, shaped wings. There, there are a couple called angle wings and they fly with alternating flaps and glides. Flap, flap, glide. One of them is called a snout and it has palpi or palps um, that are like mouth parts that help to detect food, but you can see he's got a long snoz or a long snout. And they can look really different depending upon the position that you find them in. The question mark and the comma look really, really similar, except that one has an extra dot when its wings are open and an extra dot when its wings are closed. So the comma just has the larger backwards C uh, and has one less dot on its uh, wings when they're open. But they're called angle wings because of these crazy angles, the way that they're cut out uh, on their wings. Uh, this is a morning cloak, the one that can live for a year. And uh, the wood nymph, which we usually find kind of underneath things or in the, in, along the shoreline uh, in the grasses. Uh, so not as easy to see uh, as some of the others. The hackberry and tawny emperor, they like hackberry trees. And sometimes they are very hard to see because they have their wings closed and they sit on the bark of the hackberry tree. The hackberry tree has all these bumps on it. And so these um, butterflies look like they're just another big bump on the side of the tree. So if you're out looking for them, you stop at a big old hackberry tree and you look with your binoculars up and down the tree to see if you can find them. You're gonna look, you're gonna feel pretty stupid if it turns out you're not a monarch. And so there he is sitting there thinking he's a monarch. And here's what the monarch butterfly looks like, these two pictures on the right. But here is a viceroy. And um, at lunchtime, I went out into the yard and I saw a viceroy for the first time this whole year. Um, the viceroy has this extra, um, black line on it is a little bit smaller. And both of these butterflies eat um, plants that are uh, kind of toxic and unpalatable. So there are big orange and black, um, you know, features uh, tell their predators uh, not to eat them. Milkweeds um, are the host plant and uh, nectar plant for not only the monarchs, but also other butterflies. Um, the monarch doesn't need just common milkweed, uh, like this upper left hand picture, but they can also use swamp milkweed or butterfly weed. This monarch caterpillar, um, and there's a whole bunch of them on this plant, uh, 
they found our butterfly weed one year and they ate the entire thing to the ground because it was the only milkweed around that they could find. So they can be very hungry eaters uh, and, and, and kill the plant uh, if there's not enough milkweed in the area for them to eat. Satyrs are small and medium size brown and they often have eye spots and they usually fly uh, in the woods or close to the woods. Um, the gem satyr is my favorite because of this beautiful little gem on its hind wing. And the little wood satyr, we haven't seen that many of them, but this year uh, at York River State Park, they were all over the place. So butterflies have good years and not so good years. And this year was a really good year for these little wood satyrs. Here are some other satyrs. Um, the northern pearly eye, uh, mostly found in the woods, is a little bit bigger, really beautiful. The Appalachian brown um, is just a little bit smaller, and the Carolina satyr is the smallest of the satyrs. Skippers. There are 250 skippers species uh, in the United States. They are very rapid in flight. They have hook-shaped antennas. They sometimes have very hairy bodies, triangular wings, and a small body size compared, uh, uh, small wing size compared to the body size. So if you look at this abdomen, the abdomen is longer than the wings. It's larger. It's a large abdomen compared to the, compared to the size of the wings. And this is a, a broad wing skipper. There are two subspecies, there are two groups of, um, of uh, skippers. One is called spread wing and the other group is the grass skippers. So spread wing skippers often uh, bask with their wings open. So here's a long tail skipper that you can see this time of year. They're out kind of at the end of the summer. Horace's dusky wing kind of uh, flies most of the year. And this little common checkered skipper looks like a moth, looks like something really tiny or even a fly uh, on the ground in the grass. Um, but if you really take a close look, it's a beautiful uh, little skipper. And these are all the spread wing skippers. The most uh, common one for gardens is the silver spotted skipper and has that big white or silver patch on its side. And more often you see it like on the right, um, but interesting when it opens up its wings, I've had people say to me, what is this butterfly? And I said, you just have to wait and see what it, what it looks like when it closes its wings. Uh, at the botanical garden, there's American wisteria and you can uh, certain times of the year find little caterpillars of the silver spotted skipper on, uh, on that very large vine that they have. The grass skippers uh, feed on grasses and sedges. They're usually orange or tawny, have stout bodies, fast flight, short wings, um, and their hind wings often spread farther apart, so they kind of look like a jet airplane. Um, so here, there's one wing up and the other wing comes out. The hind wing comes out and the forewing goes up. Some of these skippers look almost exactly alike, so it's very hard to tell them apart. And the size of the skippers vary considerably. The least skipper, as you can see here, the least skipper is really, really tiny. This is a sachem. Sachem we often find in our garden and it's known for its black stigma on the male. Uh, the female often uh, is dark and has a chevron shape on it. Um, but we've seen a lot of these uh, in our garden or at the community gardens this year. The Zabulon is my favorite little 
skipper. Um, I told you a little bit about its uh, speedy flight and uh, defending its territory. And uh, another thing that's really interesting is the female looks so different than the male. And this picture doesn't give it justice. This butterfly can be chocolate and purple. It's really a beautiful uh, butterfly, little tiny butterfly. Here is a picture of kind of the chocolate and the purple. And I couldn't resist putting this in because the passion vine was just so beautiful. There are some variations in the way that um, some of the butterflies look and the way that they behave. So here is an intermediate Eastern tiger swallowtail. So it's, it's kind of the black morph, but it also has more yellow in it. So uh, it just looks a little bit different. And this is an orange sulfur, but it's white, white and green. So again, color variation is, can be very different. Um, size, uh, females can be larger than males. And in the springtime, some butterflies are much smaller uh, than, uh, than they are later in the year. So one of the ones that they talk about frequently is the zebra swallowtail that almost has no tail. The tail is very short uh, when it first comes out, when the first brood comes out in the spring. You can have wear and tear. So this is a question mark but you can't tell that it's an angle wing because all of its uh, angles have been chewn off or worn off. Here is uh, a white M hair streak. I hadn't mentioned this one before. It's not as common, but it has incredible color when its wings are open. Uh, you don't see that very often uh, because they usually sit with their wings closed. But this, particular butterfly, the unexpected behavior was that it was on crepe myrtle. And crepe myrtle uh, is not, um, it, everybody loves crepe myrtle because it's so beautiful, but it doesn't attract very many insects. And so to have this butterfly uh, on the crepe myrtle is really kind of a, a rare event. There are threats for butterflies. So some of these natural predators are out there and they are looking um, for butterflies to eat. So the top one is a robber fly and you can see that it has a skipper and the garden spider uh, has a uh, looks like a little satyr, maybe a, a Carolina satyr. And this uh, praying mantis is out on the mountain mint just waiting to grasp somebody. There are a lot of human threats to pollinators. Um, we have a corner up in Croker that is just covered with kutsu. Uh, it is a terribly invasive plant, and it is just over the top of all of the plants that were on that corner. So the who the only animals that live there seem to be the groundhogs that have underground uh, uh, houses, you know. Building and development and mowing, using pesticides, changing weather patterns, disease and parasites that seem to be spreading more rapidly, and pollution all affect our pollinators, our butterflies and our bees and our moths. You can advocate for late season mowing. Um, we have one uh, person in our Native Plant Society who suggests that if you mow, you should mow uh, you know, once a year along the power line in, in uh, late February. Um, after all of the birds have eaten all of the seeds off of all of the plants uh, and um, a lot of the um, insects um, have, uh, have overwintered uh, and have started to come back out. Power lines are one of the best places to look for butterflies. You can create, restore, and preserve habitats. You can advocate in your parks uh, and public places. 
um, to try to have people be more aware of the native plants that are needed to support uh, the butterflies and the pollinators. You can have host plants in your yard, like these black swallowtails eating rue or parsley or dill. Um, they like our, our garden uh, vegetables. You can plant nectar plants. Um, we have devil's walking sticks planted in our yard because we know how important uh, the flowers are for the pollinators and also the berries are for migrating birds. Joe Pieweed down here has a red banded hair streak on it. And this uh, lavender minarda is a really uh, great plant for attracting uh, insects. You can plant in layers. One of the things that uh, really um, upsets me is in a lot of the parks, they mow the lawn right up to the trees. So there's no place for any flowers or shrubs uh, to grow. So think about planting in layers um, in front of the trees uh, and see if you can't find some uh, native plants. You can plant uh, for color and continuous bloom. So you can have blue flowers and red flowers and white flowers and yellow flowers uh, that attract um, butterflies. Many of these are uh, later season plants. The blue mist flower, for example, is blooming right now. Um, and so are these some of these asters. You can plant in sunny locations. There's my husband and there's a um, long-tailed skipper on the lantana. Lantana is not a native plant, but it's one where the butterflies just love the nectar. You can provide damp areas um, and rotting fruit, they like that. You can have a, a nice warm stone for the butterfly to warm up on. So, uh, my husband puts out different rotting fruit and the butterflies just love it. Um, mud, damp mud and sand provides nutrients. So the butterflies will often gather on that. You can attract butterflies to your garden. You can enlarge your garden beds, reduce your lawn size, mow your lawn sparingly, don't use pesticides and fertilizers if you don't need to. Um, and uh, don't use electric zappers. They seem to attract insects and then indiscriminately kill them. You can put other things uh, in your lawn, um, pussy toes or violets um, and a lot of other plants. You don't have to have grass uh, all the time. This um, white clover is not a native, but it is great for uh, nectar. And it also is really good uh, for fixing nitrogen in the soil. So it's a good uh, plant to have in amongst your grass. Uh, you can learn more about pollinators and habitats. And here, are a whole bunch of butterflies, swallowtails. There are Eastern tiger swallowtails and Palamedes swallowtails. And this picture was taken in the Dismal Swamp and they are all uh, puddling on bear poop. So the bear poops and they think it is wonderful, all those nutrients. So that's uh, basically the, the end of the, of the presentation, the end of my pictures. But I do have a couple of cartoons if anybody wants to see cartoons. Oh yes, please do right. share. Okay, so I told you I was a beautiful winged creature trapped in the body of a disgusting worm. Ha ha ha. <laughs> Just what is taking her so long? <laughs> She went upstairs to change. I had not ever seen that one. <laughs> change is imminent. 
And okay, maybe our kid isn't cut out for lacrosse. Maybe he's gonna be an entomologist. Uh oh, this is my leaf, go away. You're not the boss of me. Oh my God, these little kids are so annoying. Ha ha ha. All right, butterfly binoculars, these uh, pentos, uh, pentax papilios, which means butterfly in French, are, uh, can focus up to only 18 inches away. And I use them for everything. I go on, use them for plant walks and all sorts of other stuff. For more information, there's uh, the North American Butterfly Association. There's the Butterflies and Moths of North America. There's eButterfly. There's the Butterfly Association of Virginia. Lots of, lots of resources. These are some of the books that I used in order to learn more and to give us background for the presentation. Uh, the pictures here are from a lot of different people. People send me pictures all the time to help uh, identify them or just to show me how wonderful uh, photograph they found or what species they found. And this is me, if you wanna email uh, Gary and I, here is our home email. Well, Adrian, okay. your knowledge as always is um, awesome. <laughs> There's, there's quite a lot there. Uh, we're going to hold on one second here. There we go. Very good. I actually have a couple of questions for you. Okay. Okay. And one was, and I don't remember the butterfly that this was associated with, but you described its flight pattern as floppy. Do you remember which, which butterfly is that? And I don't understand floppy flight. Can you... <laughs> You know, I mean, <laughs> um, the, the larger butterflies, like the eastern tiger swallowtail, their their wings just kind of like go all over the place. Okay, okay, all right. Thank you. And and <laughs> and, and monarchs because they're big, they're going to be they're moving a little bit more slowly. Yeah, and, and they can they can their their wings are very flexible. Yes. So, so that's why I use that word floppy. Okay, thank you. Um, do you have, and I know you mentioned that the Zabulon skipper was your favorite skipper. Do you have a favorite butterfly, a personal favorite? And uh, I'm, putting, I'm putting you on the spot. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, I, I don't know that it isn't the Zabulon because, okay. because of its behavior. I mean, it is so entertaining. Yes. You see these little guys zipping around and they're so beautiful. They're really gorgeous little butterflies. And then last question I had, you had a list of resources and I will list several of them and then there'll be the slide on the presentation. But do you have a, for somebody who is just perhaps starting out, trying to figure out, you know, which butterfly is which, do you have a recommended field guide that they could carry with them or grab on their way out the back door to run around the garden? Well, um, as you know, at Freedom Park, we had um, our butterfly brochure there. And that brochure, and, and I'm not sure that I have a copy of it handy, um, it has um, the most common butterflies in the Williamsburg area. And it has about 60 butterflies on it. Um, I use most frequently uh, Kaufman. Kaufman. And this book is really nice because it shows you the butterfly with closed wings and open wings, and it has little arrows to point out uh, if there's something in particular that you should see for that butterfly. Um, and uh, so you can tell I have this all marked up and it's a little bit worn because I use it all, all, the, all the time, but this has a, a lot of different butterflies in it. Well, I learned several things today and um, I am just so grateful for you for spending your time with us. And thank you so much again. Thank you, Judith. All right, we'll see you soon. Take care. Bye-bye from the garden.
Bye-bye.